I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I am specifically a professor within the School of Information. School of Information is this extraordinary space within the university that does a lot of work in informatics, uh, digital reproduction of documents, the maintenance and pre preservation of historical documents and the like. But the project that I've been asked to do, that we've been doing for the last 10 years, really centers on the first mental institution, not only in the United States, but anywhere else in the world, exclusively for people of African descent. The hospital opened in 1868, and it was segregated by race from its opening until 1968. So there was approximately 100 years of segregated mental health care that was provided. What makes the hospital, in addition to its origin, so special is that they kept all of their records. So in the last 10 years, what we've done from the university is that we have digitized about 800,000 of those records, somewhere around five to seven million pages of materials. We've also had access to about 36,000 photographs, negative slides that give us some pictorial review of what treatment in this hospital was like. The most fascinating thing about the study is that we compared the period of strict segregation, 1868 to about 1968, the data on admissions and diagnoses with data on admissions and diagnoses during the integrated period, 1970 to 2000. And part of what we did was to look at diagnoses, admissions, age, and we look for what we call correlates. What factors influence admissions to the psychiatric hospital during the psychiatric era as opposed to the integrated era? And the findings there are probably the most significant, that there was not in fact much difference whatsoever between the factors that brought people into the hospital during the segregated era and the factors that brought people to the hospital during the integrated era. And that's in many respects troubling. It doesn't mean that the system itself was not aware of some of those kinds of issues because there were many issues that were influenced and influential by black families as well. For example, uh, we found in our material that African-American families tend to delay help seeking for psychiatric causes for up to 30 years. That's something that uh, Woody Neighbors at the University of Michigan had found years ago that was replicated in the material that we uncovered. So to have uh, a relative still in the household with a serious mental illness for 30 years suggests that at the point that they are eventually admitted to a psychiatric hospital, they're very likely to have a more serious illness than they would have had if they'd sought treatment 30 years ago. So when you ask those same families, what is it that explains why you waited so long? They will say, for the most part, we receive services from our pastor, from our church, from our friends, from our other relatives, and we found that satisfactory. So that's been one of the most significant of all of the findings as well. One of the things that stands out is the overdiagnosis of severe mental illness. Going back really to the 1840s, schizophrenia, not certainly not using that terminology then, but for the most part, the overdiagnosis of severe mental illness, particularly in African American men, in what we call the then, in the 1840s, 1850s, and now, uh, in the period 1970 to 2000. This overdiagnosis phenomena is certainly there. We also found in the material three major hypotheses that were used really going back to the 1840s. The first of those hypotheses that were put forward was that race and skin color offered immunity from illness. So in the very early years, from probably the 1700s up through the middle part of the 1800s, the notion was that black people did not develop mental illness. And there were, for the most part, no services available to them. It was only after the rumblings about the end of slavery that that hypothesis changed. And the hypothesis changed to become one in which it was forecast, using the 1840 census, I should add, that with freedom would come exponential rates of mental illness in the black population.
Thus, it was necessary to have services, hospitals, prisons, uh, different ways of controlling the black population post the end of slavery. And indeed, that's what started to occur. So we could see in our data that the small number of African Americans who were in state mental institutions, 1860, early 1870s, it exploded. So that by 1950, Central State Hospital had 5,000 patients there. The 5,000 patients may seem like a phenomenally small number, but it isn't. It represented almost 2% of all of the psychiatric patients in mental institutions throughout the United States. That's extraordinary. The 1840 census, there's a, there's a new book out by Peter Shore. It's called Counting Americans. And in there, he dissects the 1840 census. And he says it was the only United States census that paid the greatest amount of attention to mental illness. Part of what the 1840 census data suggested was as African Americans achieved freedom and moved north, the proportion or the percentage or the frequency of mental illness increased, suggesting that slavery was better for black people's mental health than freedom. And they also suggested then that the more Africans experience freedom, the greater the sense or the frequency of mental illness. And that continued in the research literature from the 1840s really up until the 1860s. There were new diagnoses made of African Americans, one called drapetomania, for example, that there was this predisposition on the part of African Americans to want to run away from slavery and that that was considered to be pathological. So there really wasn't in the early days much in the way of an explanation for that phenomena or for that level of bias or for the faulty use of statistics to make the case that freedom was inimical to the mental health of African American people. We looked at a variety of things having to do with the data. One, we were interested in privacy. Who should have access to psychiatric records that are vintage, that are archival, that are certainly very old? Who should have access? Should families have access? Should scholars have access to this data? What about uh, people in the media? So that was one of the things we looked at. We also looked at the readiness and the capability of state systems to really manage the data. Uh, were they uh, prepared in terms of their IT setups to really manage data like that? Could they handle it? Third issue that we had was what data from this material are families willing to share? Are they willing to share with each other? Are they willing to share with scholars? And then we asked scholars the same question. How would you like to access this particular amount of data? So we used all of that in such a way as to then suggest there are things in this material, 100 years of segregated data, 100, almost 50 years of integrated data that have implications for education, implication for services. Well, like what? Well, the delayed help seeking on the part of African American families. That's operative today. So in a university, medical school, department of psychiatry, psychology, social work, counseling, how do we increase the understanding that African-American families have about mental illness so that they don't delay seeking services. And I might point out that this delayed help-seeking phenomenon is not just in the area of mental health. It's there in breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and some other areas. So I think it's important in medical and other educational areas to identify ways, perhaps through research, experimentation, how we can increase literacy of African-American families. Another thing that we found that should be part of our education as well, African-American families depend on their churches, on their ministers, on their fellow parishioners for assistance in this process of understanding health and mental health issues. Well, we ought to integrate some of that. We ought to find ways in the curriculum, find ways to basically increase the level of collaboration between health providers and ministers in such a way that they become collaborators in the provision of high quality mental health care.